Hello, everyone. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is Josh Kaufman. He is the author of The First 20 Hours. Uh, he is the author of The Personal MBA and has been ranked number one in Amazon's business and money category. So today, we're going to pick his brain on the high level in a personal MBA book, but more importantly, the book that I think you might all benefit from, which is The First 20 Hours. So let's get started. Three, two, one. Welcome everyone. Today, another special guest, uh, a very accomplished writer and author, author of the personal MBA and uh, the first 20 hours. And there's a third book um, and I'll let him explain too, but his name is Josh Kaufman. He's been on TED Talks and a number of other forums. And so thankful to have him on today. How you doing, Josh? Thomas, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Um, I forget, what is the third book that you've written? It's called How to Fight a Hydra. That's what it is, yeah. And, and what's, the, uh, what's the premise of that book? Yeah, so it's, that is my first fictional uh, story. So a little bit of an allegory. And, and it um, is, is an interesting way of um, talking about ambition, uncertainty, risk, and fear of the unknown. All within fiction. Yes, yeah. So it's, some, it's, talking about uncertainty is not the, necessarily the most comfortable nonfiction topic to write about yeah. in a research-based Away. So, so what I did was take all of the research-based ways to deal with those things in a skillful way and just show you the process of someone using them instead of explaining them in, in a nonfiction sort of way, advice sort of way. You know, it's an interesting um, background because your, your books are, you know, just openly speaking, the personal MBA is, you know, it's a, it's a summarized version of the MBA, which I think many can use but the first 20 hours is a unique twist on learning uh, this fiction book. So what, I mean, what, what drives you to write these topics? And I guess, how has your journey got you to this point today? Yeah, my, my general MO when I'm writing is, um, it's all very research-based. And so for the personal MBA, I was, I was looking at, there, there are thousands of excellent business books in the world that can teach you really what you need to know in order to do business well whatever industry or market you happen to be in. But all of the good parts are locked up into these single books, sometimes that are not very well known. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do with the personal MBA is if you want to learn about business, um, even assuming you, you don't have any experience, you don't have any knowledge in this area, you just want to get up to speed with what you need to know very quickly. I wanted to take all of the important, valuable ideas about this topic and put them into the best, most complete introductory work on the subject that I could muster. And so instead of having to read hundreds or thousands of books to, to get these ideas, there's, there's just one guide. You can pick it up, read through the whole thing, and have a really good, solid working understanding of, of how businesses work. Yeah, and you know, um, going through the book myself, I'll, I'll tell you from having you know, an MBA that it goes far deeper than a natural MBA. Um, and there's just a lot of models and concepts that you share in there that um, are probably pertinent to a lot of you know, entrepreneurs or real estate investors or anyone that I usually talk to on a day-to-day -day basis. So definitely worth picking up for all you out there. Um, but what I more want to talk about is the book, The First 20 Hours. I come across a lot of people who um, are starting out on one path or another, and the process of learning is definitely needed in their process. So um, obviously a lot to that book, but I would love to take your, your opinion on that, kind of what, what drew your, your attention to that book and um, what, what should you know, one get out of that book? Yeah, I think uh, you can see the, the, the first 20 hours came out of the personal MBA in many senses. So if, if there's a set of knowledge and skills that you can practice to get good at business, um, and, and it doesn't take a very long time to learn those things. Like there's, there's a core set of knowledge, there's a core set of practices that make an enormous difference. If you focus on that first, you can learn business very quickly and very well. Uh, the first 20 hours is an extension of that idea is, is there a process to learn anything quickly? Is there a process that you can go from zero to capable or zero to functional in a, a, a straightforward, not complicated, very short period of time. And so um, as I usually do, I, I go back to the research literature mm -hmm. and it turns out there is, 
it's not very well known. It's been locked up in, in psychology journals and, and textbooks for a very long time. But when you look at the literature about how people learn, so it, when they start doing something they've never done before, one of the things that's very apparent is the early hours of practicing a new skill are always very efficient from, from a learning and capability standpoint. That's when you're going to see the highest rate of growth you're ever going to experience in the process of learning or practicing this particular skill. The challenge is that those early hours of skill acquisition are also the most frustrating. Mm. That's the point where you know what you wanna do, you usually know what good performance looks like, and you're watching yourself trying to do this thing and it's not working and it's very, very frustrating. Most people quit after maybe a few hours. Um, just because the, the delta between what you want to do and what you are capable of doing just feels so insurmountable. Yeah, so, you know, yesterday I had a, uh, I had a guest on, he's a retired Navy SEAL, and we were talking about this concept of, of uh, uh, chunking, right? So basically, you know, I play guitar for 21 years now, and I was telling him, and I'm sure most advanced musicians go through this where they hit that threshold, and every day that they practice, they have to hit that threshold, stretch a little bit, and they see, you know, minimal gain. What it sounds like is that from what you're saying, in the beginning of a learning process, you probably have a huge amount of gain with less amount of effort, but the process for frustration is way higher. Is that accurate? That's, that's absolutely right. So yeah, I mean, think about yourself playing guitar right now. Right. Um, the gains are very small. They're very incremental. Um, sometimes you reach a plateau and it feels like you're not sure. improving at all. That's, that has as its own inherent frustrations in it. Um, when you think of someone who wants to play the guitar, but they've never picked up a guitar before, they have no idea what they're doing. Um, they don't know what a fretboard is. They don't know how to tune their guitar. Um, they may have the idea in their mind of a chord, but they've never played one. Just a few hours of practice can get somebody holding a guitar that is tuned, introduce the concept of a chord, and have them playing a handful of chords in an hour or two, maybe. So when you look at going from absolutely nothing to, it might not be great, but they're playing the guitar in a way that they've never been able to before. If you approach those early hours of practice in a smart way, you can see extreme rapid gains in capability in a very short period of time. Definitely fascinating. So point that back to, you know, whether it be business or some sort of investing topic, right? Uh, how, how would you suggest that one approaches a new topic like, let's say, tax strategy, right? Not the most appealing for most, but sure. a very complex one in itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the process that I talk about in the first 20 hours, in general, five steps, which are universal to everything. And, and the first uh, thing that I talk about, and I don't think it's emphasized enough, is deciding what you want to be able to do. So I think well, on a, a real estate investing uh, example, if you just, if your goal is to quote unquote, get better at tax strategy, that's a really difficult thing to do anything with. It's hard to imagine what that looks like, particularly if you don't know what, what you need, uh, what you need to do. So um, maybe, so deciding what exactly in a concrete specific way performance looks like goes a really long way in helping you figure out what you need to learn, what you need to practice, what solid performance in this area looks like. So maybe you're getting ready for tax season and there are, uh, and you want to be prepared. There are, there are forms or spreadsheets or things that you can send to your accountant that would make their life easier, would save you time and energy. Um, so it's, I want to prepare everything that I need to turn over to my accountant by February 1st of, of the coming year. Mm -hmm. that's something you can do something with. And so once you've decided what you want to be able to do, deconstructing the skill into smaller parts is, is typically the next step. And the reason that we do this is because some of the things that we think of as skills are actually not individual skills. They're bundles of smaller sub skills. And so by breaking apart, you know, as, as we were talking about earlier on the guitar, it, um, understanding what chords are and how they're formed 
is a sub-skill of playing the guitar. It's not the whole thing, but it is a portion that you need to get good at if you want to be able to do this thing. So breaking the skill down into smaller parts gives you a couple of benefits. First, it makes the, the skill a lot less overwhelming. Uh, second, it gives you a target for your research and your practice. And so, you know, for example, if it, on the, under the tax strategy, um, maybe you've played with spreadsheets a little bit in the past, like you know what an Excel document is and you know how to open it up, but advanced formulas are far beyond your capability. That's a discrete subskill. Let me get good at doing this specific kind of formula. Let me practice that. Let me pull data from some other sources um, in, a, in maybe an automated way. Those are discrete subskills that you can practice. Yep. Okay. So interesting. So more or less, when you have your your goal in mind, um, understanding what you want that outcome to look like first. Yes. Then uh, from there. Breaking down, and again, this is interesting because this is exactly what we were talking about yesterday on the Navy SEAL call, um, this idea of, you know, breaking down the task into smaller pieces and then mastering each, not mastering, but more or less mastering each one of the steps along the way. So same thing here, identify the performance outcome or the desired outcome, and then break down into, um, you know, micro lessons, if you will. And then mm -hmm. would you say that arguably, you know, once you have those four or five micro lessons, you then do the same process to them, or is it just those five master, if you will, and then you're done. Yeah, it, it, it really depends on the skill that you're looking at. Um, some skills are relatively sha shallow in the sense that you de deconstruct some parts, and then if you can do those parts, you can do the whole thing. Um, sometimes you, you can find rabbit holes of you know, a, a topic that you can go arbitrarily deep on, and every layer of deconstruction you go down comes back to that first step of deciding what you want to be able to do. It's like, and so when you're looking at each of those discrete subscales, like, is this going to help me get to what I want or is this a rabbit trail or distraction that I can just set aside for now? Yep. Um, the other thing that deconstruction helps you do, and I think this is a really important distinction that's not made enough, um, Deconstructing skills into smaller parts helps you research each subskill in a specific way. So like going back to the tax example, if you're researching how to do formulas in Excel, you can find books, you can find courses, you can find websites, you can find resources that can help you learn some of the concepts or conceptual knowledge that you need to have in order to do this. But research is not practice. Uh, too much research is actually a subtle form of procrastination. You're not getting to the point of doing the thing. You're spending way too much time learning around the thing. And so the, the general rule is, is you want to do just enough research to get started in the actual practice. The, the rule of thumb that I really like at this stage is how quickly can you start making mistakes? How yeah. quickly can you learn the things you need to learn to be able to start doing the thing and then self-correct as you're practicing. So just enough to know like, oh, I did this, it's not quite right. I'm not seeing what I expect. Let me go back and do it again. And, and it's that loop, doing right. things um, uh, and, and then correcting your practice as you go. That's where the actual learning happens. Yeah, and, and, and obviously it's gonna vary topic to topic, right? Um, yeah. I guess the more in depth or the more, you know, uh, shallow a topic will be, I, I assume the faster that point will, will arrive. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, so, but that's, that's a good point to be, I think, dig a little deeper on. So, you know, people that I talk, talk to are constantly learning. Um, are there general signs, maybe two or three signs that they've hit that point at which they can, you know, uh, I guess begin making mistakes and, you know, uh, be, on, be on the right path. Yes. I would say, um, and this is kind of an arbitrary cap, but I think one, two hours of research maybe um, before you start jumping in. I mean, even sometimes it's, it's, if it's not dangerous, if you're not going to screw something important up by jumping in, the faster you can get into doing the thing you want to do, the better. Mm -hmm. um, and because you'll also find as you're practicing, you're learning things about the skill as it is performed that you wouldn't necessarily understand or appreciate no. until you get to the point where you're trying to do the thing. 
So then an, a little bit of additional research at that point can make sense in a way that a little bit, uh, that same amount of research earlier in the process might just completely go over your head. Yep, yep, I hear you on that. So taking a differing uh, look at this, so you mentioned earlier that you know many people do fail in the process of learning a new skill, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's, it's equally important to not just talk about what success might look like or the measurement of success, but also what failure looks like. So maybe define for us what are some indications that, well, I mean, obviously just, just the stopping of the act, but beyond just not doing the learning, what, what are some other signs that maybe you're not doing this correctly? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, there, are, there are two really important things. The, the first is that oftentimes our environment is not conducive to learning what it, or practicing what it is we need to practice in a way that's going to benefit us long-term. Um, so your phone ringing, your kids coming in the room, um, there, there are all sorts of outside distractions that can keep us, when, when we finally get ourselves to sit down and do the practice, uh, they can keep us from practicing in a quality way. So the term of art that, that many people have probably heard of is deliberate practice. You are, you are practicing with full focus, full intention, no distractions, no outside forces that are keeping you from, from putting 100% of your time and energy into what's in front of you. That's really important. Um, the other part, which you alluded to, like the biggest reason that people do not benefit from this process is because they stop too soon. Mm -hmm. And so as adult learners, we're not used to feeling frustrated. We're not used to, to having the experience of wanting to do something and trying to do something and not being able to do something. And we know that how we're performing is not up to the standards of what we would like it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, kids have a much better time with this. Um, and I don't think there's, there's a huge difference between how quickly children learn versus adults learn. I think children are generally way more willing to go, oh, well, that didn't work. Let me try it again. You know, they get back on the skateboard. They get back on the bike um, and they'll fall down uh, tens, hundreds of times, but they'll keep doing it because they want the end result. Um, I think adults have the same capability. We just need a little bit more of an understanding that this is inherent in the process. There's nothing wrong with you. It doesn't mean that you're not talented at this. It doesn't mean that you're not capable of doing it or that you're always going to be terrible. It just means that practice is required. And so where the first 20 hours, the title comes from, is from the fifth step of this methodology, which is pre-committing to 20 hours of focus practice. And the pre-commitment is, is a, a cognitive and behavioral psychology technique that does two really important things for adult learners. Um, first, if you're not willing to commit at least that amount of time to learning a new skill, it's a good check step for for us, I mean, we're, we're all busy. We have lots of things to do. We're juggling things all the time. If what it is you want to learn is not important enough to invest at least that amount of time into learning and getting better at, you might have other better things to do. That's a valuable thing to know going in. The second point or the second part why it works is that 20 hours of focused deliberate practice is enough to get very competent at pretty much anything. You will, you will see a substantial improvement in your capability if you invest that amount of time. What the, the 20 hour pre-commitment does is it's a way of overcoming that early frustration barrier. Um, so when I'm doing this for myself, um, the, the, way, the way that I think about it is in the early parts of the process, it's okay if I'm terrible. It's okay if I can't do it. It's okay if I'm frustrated. It's okay if I want to quit. Those are all normal feelings. This pre-commitment means that I am not going to quit until I have invested at least 20 hours into trying to do that thing. If I get to that point and I still hate it and I'm still terrible and I, I still think that there are other better ways that I could invest my time, 
absolutely, I'll just do something else. But I'm not going to make that determination until I get to at least that amount of time invested. Interesting. So, so why is that not step one versus being step five? So it, it would seem to me that, you know, that simple bet out question of, okay, do I want to spend 20 hours, probably at least a week worth of work? Uh, yes or no. If yes, then proceed. Why, why do you think step five is more appropriate than step, than step one? Yeah. So I think step one being very clear. So having clear and spe- a spe- clear and specific idea about exactly what you want to be able to do is what allows you to imagine what the the practice or what the the it. what it looks like to be able to do this thing. If you don't have that clearly in mind, it's really hard to pre-commit to getting to that point. Uh, I, the the common failure state. Um, I usually use use a language example for this. So, like learning Italian is this big, scary, nebulous thing that you can't do much with. And so pre-committing to practicing to get to that nebulous end state is emotionally and mentally difficult to do. But saying like, okay, I'm going to learn the ins and outs of, of formulas in Excel so I can do the spreadsheet for my attorney. That's something that your brain can, can wrap its mind around. Um, one of the capabilities that our mind has that is unique and valuable is mental simulation. So we can imagine a possible future state or a scenario in which something is true. Um, But that capability can't work unless you supply your mind a destination. And so the more concretely and specifically you can imagine what the end state looks like, the easier it is for your mind to fill in the blanks that will allow you to get there. Got it. Yeah, so so essentially the, the first steps are really around the planning uh, you know, defining the target and what, what you would like to outcome, breaking down the, the subsets and then, which that in itself is all work, right? I think you would have yeah. to use some work to even get to that point. Um, and then committing to yourself that I'm going to give this 20 hours and then see the outcome. Yeah. And, and what's, what's amazing about this process is that it really is universal. So you can apply it to, to anything, your, your, your career, um, things that you do for fun, um, and also across the range of, of physical or motor skills versus cognitive skills. Um, it, it really is the same process every time. Uh, and, and just understanding that this is what skill acquisition in the real world looks like allows you to do it in a strategic, consistent way. And it's, it's going into the process, knowing what it looks like, knowing what it feels like, having a strategy will help you make the most out of those early hours of learning. Yep. Yeah. And this is, this is definitely a, um, a lot of my clients could benefit from this framework that you've, you've built and apply it to many of the topics that I, I talk about. Um, Cause these are not the most complex topics necessarily, but they often don't know where to begin. They don't know what they're trying to accomplish and they, but they have the commitment and I think they would definitely do a 20 hour commitment. Um, but they don't have the framework in place. So, this is, this is a fantastic framework from what I'm hearing. Um, and I'll have to start intertwining it into my life as well. So thanks. Um, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Josh, so what else, I mean, what else are you up to? Um, obviously you've had two good books. Um, I've not, I've not read the other one, the uh, fiction one, but I assume that's a good one as well. Um, so where, where are you going from here in the next three to five years with your, your research and your studies? Yeah, that is, that is always the million dollar question. Um, I, I think, so I've, I've worked with, with all of my books uh, with, with a wonderful friend and editor. His name is David Moldauer, uh, who was my first editor on, on Personal MBA when the first edition was published. And I've been working with him ever since. Um, David says that if I ever write a memoir, the title needs to be Down the Rabbit Hole because that's just how I approach my my research in my life yeah. and and so um the thing that i get the most joy and value out of is finding some complex area of life that is important and valuable and trying to understand and figure that out for myself because i care about it because it's important and then in the process i'm doing all of this reading and research and experimenting and if I find something that seems to be universal or that, that 
many people will benefit from, that's when I take the step into condensing it in and, and consolidating it into something like the personal MBA or the first 20 hours or, or Hydra. And so uh, the adventure part of, of the work is enjoyable to, enjoyable to me. I love the variety. And so um, I just finished a deep dive into audio recording and engineering because I did the, the audio book for the first 20 hours myself. Um, all the way from recording to final mastering and and uploading all of that, I loved it. I don't know if I'm going to do anything, you know, in in the the business sense of it, but um, that was the most recent hmm. project where I was doing all of this for myself for something that was important and meaningful for me. Um, and I also think it's important. Um, I have not committed. I mean, I'm a full time working researching. Uh, a researcher and author, but I haven't committed to a next project. And part of that is because I have a lot of exploration and experimentation and, and research that goes into, into the whole process. And so uh, the next three to five years, I don't know. And that's part of the fun and part of the, the exciting part. Let me, let, me, let me ask you a question. I just put these acoustic panels up. Am I at all in the correct alignment of what, how they should be lined up? Uh, yes. So, so uh, keeping them, them crosswise, that's exactly the way to do it. Okay. Right. Um, where can people find you? Do you have any upcoming events? I know it's all digital nowadays, but at some point I assume you'll be out on the road and speaking and uh, doing whatever else. Yeah. So um, the best place to find me is at joshkaufman.net. And that's, that's where I put all of my latest research writing um, links to all of the websites for my books. So you can find the first, the personal MBA first 20 hours and how to fight a Hydra there. Um, and it, yeah, in, in our, our brave new world, um, I decided early on in my career that traveling to speak was not going to be a huge part of my business. Um, mostly because I, I have, I have two kids, um, uh, about to turn 10 and about to turn seven. And, uh, I would rather have a uh, platinum status with my kids than platinum status with an airline. That's and sure. so, uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, I've, I've been, uh, my career is very bimodal in the sense that I'm either like permitting and researching and writing and making something new, or I'm out and talking about it. And so now is the out and talking about it phase and meeting lots of cool people and having good conversations. Yes. And then at some point, um, I will shift back into the making cool stuff mode. And yep. so who knows when that will be, but uh, probably within the, the next six months or so, I'm guessing. Yep, that's awesome. And so for all you listening out there, I'll put the links um, for the podcast in the podcast notes and for YouTube videos will be in the YouTube uh, uh, notes as well. And uh, for all the email people out there, um, you'll, you'll get this in your emails as well. So Josh, I appreciate the time today and uh, thanks again. Thanks for having me, Tom. It's a pleasure. <laughs>